Hey, 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 friends. Welcome to the Renaissance English History Podcast. I am your host, Heather Tesco. I'm a storyteller who makes history accessible because I believe it's the pathway to understanding who we are, our place in the universe, and being more deeply in touch with our own humanity. This is episode, I think, 217. I'm going to have to look it up. But in this episode, we are going to spend 24 hours in Cambridge. I love doing these like 24 hours in episodes. I did one on London. I think I did another one. I forget uh, last year. Anyway, I, I just love them. I love taking like a slice of life for, I don't know, just kind of going through a whole day in a particular place and talking about what was happening in that place. Uh, it's, it's a lot of fun for me to do these. So today we're talking about Cambridge, which happens to be one of my favorite places in England. I actually wrote a book centered in Cambridge, set in Cambridge, and uh, I spent a lot of time in Cambridge. It's one of, my, one of my favorite places. I used to go and sit on the bank of the river outside the Wren Library as the boats were punting back and forth. I would sit, there's a weeping willow tree and I would sit underneath it and I would watch the, the boats and I would write. It was back around 2000. I had one of those MacBook clamshell Macs. Uh, I had it for work, but I thought I was ever so cool writing with this thing. I just, I, uh, I felt like I was just the coolest thing in the world, uh, sitting underneath this willow tree writing with my clamshell. It was, it was a turquoise blue one. So if you are too young to remember those things, they were really awesome. They were like the coolest. And it was a mark of just how cool you were if you had a, a colorful clamshell uh, Mac, MacBook. They also weighed about 12 pounds. <laughs> they were so heavy. But anyway, that's, that's my story on, on Cambridge. I, I digress. I always do this. I always say, I'm just going to get right into the episode because so many people leave comments that are like, you talk too much at the beginning. And, you know, this is what it just takes you too long to get into the story. And I'm like, I don't know. There's a fast forward button. You can do that. Whatever. This is my show. I get to talk about what I want to talk about. And right now I'm talking about Cambridge. So <laughs> welcome to the newest members of my YouTube channel. Uh, if you're listening to this on YouTube, you can join super easy. And you get extra episodes, you get extra cool stuff, you get coupons to my merch shop at the highest level, you get a free TudorCon streaming ticket. So all kinds of cool stuff with the YouTube membership. Welcome, Tiffany. It's so nice to see your name there. Alexandra, Cindy, Leanne, and Teresa. Love you guys so much. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, and again, if you're listening to this on YouTube, you can go ahead and click that join button. It helps to support the podcast. You get some super cool perks. And there you go. One other thing, I have about 50 copies of the 2024 Tutor Planner available. They're sitting in a box, three boxes in my living room. If anybody would like one, you can go to tutorfair.com. I'll also stick a link here in the description. It's a super cool yearly, uh, monthly, weekly planner filled with Tudor history. I've been doing it since 2016. It's like a thing. I really love it. Tudor Planner, it's available. Check it out if you want to add more Tudor to your 2024. All right, so let's get into it, shall we? Welcome to a day in the life of Tudor Cambridge, a bustling hub of intellect and change during the time of the Reformation. We're going to be in Cambridge around circa 1540-ish. As the sun rises over the spires of this historic university town, we embark on a journey through the daily routines, challenges, and joys of its inhabitants. From the early morning stirring of servants to the scholarly debates under candlelight, each hour unfolds life profoundly touched by the winds of religious and cultural transformation. So let's start at about 5 a.m. In the dim light of pre dawn, our day begins with the soft creak of a wooden door as a servant in a modest Cambridge household stirs from her brief rest. It's 5 a.m. The town is still enveloped in a peaceful slumber. However, for the servants, the day starts now. Tasked with the vital role of kindling the fires that had died down overnight, the air is cool and crisp and the servant moves quickly, gathering kindling and logs to coax the flames back to life in the hearth. 
The fire is not just for warmth, it's the heart of the household essential for cooking and for the day's many chores. As the first light of dawn filters through the small windows, the servants' hands work deftly, a routine perfected by countless mornings. The smell of smoke and the crackling of firewood signal the beginning of another day in Tudor Cambridge, a day that holds the promise of both hard work and subtle everyday joys. By 6 a.m., the first rays of sunlight are shining on the cobbled streets of Cambridge. The town's clergy awaken to a world in the throes of religious transformation. It's 6 a.m., a time once reserved for the traditional Catholic matins, but now, amidst the Reformation, these practices are evolving. In the heart of the town, right next to the marketplace, stands the church, its spire reaching towards the dawn sky. Inside, a Protestant clergyman prepares for the morning service. Gone are the elaborate rituals and Latin chants of the Catholic Mass. Instead, he opens a well-thumbed Book of Common Prayer, a symbol of the new Anglican faith. The service is conducted in English, making the scriptures and prayers accessible to all. This shift not only changes the format of worship, but also the role of the clergy in society. They are no longer just spiritual leaders. They are educators, guides in a faith that now demands personal understanding and interpretation. The clergyman's morning is not solely spent in prayer, though. He is keenly aware of his responsibilities in this era of change. After the service, he dedicates time to studying the Bible and other theological works, including writings from reformers like Luther, like Calvin, which have recently been circulating throughout Europe. These texts challenge and refine his beliefs, equipping him to engage in the vigorous theological debates that are now common in Cambridge's academic circles. This hour reflects a community at a crossroads where ancient faith meets new thinking. The clergyman, once a guardian of tradition, now navigates a path through shifting doctrines, playing a crucial role in shaping the religious consciousness of Tudor Cambridge. As the clock strikes 7 a.m., a typical Tudor family begins their day with breakfast. In a modest, timber-framed house near the market square, a family gathers around a simple wooden table. Breakfast in Tudor times is an unpretentious affair primarily consisting of bread, cheese, and ale, with the occasional addition of cold meats for those who can afford it. The father, a local tradesman, discusses the day's work with his eldest son, who is apprenticed to follow in his footsteps. Mother, meanwhile, orchestrates the meal, assisted by her daughters, who are learning the skills necessary to manage a household. This meal is more than just sustenance. It's a time for the family to bond and plan their day. In this era, family roles are clearly defined with each member contributing to the household's well-being. The children are expected to learn and eventually master the skills of their parents, ensuring the continuity of both their trade and domestic life. As they finish their meal, the family prepares to step out into a bustling Cambridge, each to their own duties and responsibilities, reflecting the interconnected nature of work and family in Tudor society. As the clock strikes 8 a.m., the University of Cambridge, one of the oldest and most prestigious educational institutions in England, awakens to academic life. Established in the 13th century, the university has become a central fixture in Cambridge, both intellectually and economically. The university's structure is a complex mosaic of colleges, each with its own distinct character and traditions. By the 16th century, several new colleges have been established, including Christ College, which was endowed by Lady Margaret Beaufort, mother of Henry VII. King's College, with its magnificent chapel nearing completion, stands as a testament to the university's royal patronage and architectural grandeur. If you've never been to King's College and you have any opportunity to go to, like, Evensong at King's College, ah, oh, it's magnificent. So magnificent. One of my favorite places in the world. Anyway, moving on. Students at Cambridge come primarily from the gentry and the burgeoning merchant class. A university education is a privilege often reserved for those with the means to afford it or those few who secure patronage or scholarships. These young men, typically between the ages of 14 to 18 when they begin their studies, are exposed to a curriculum that, while still grounded in the classical trivium and quadrivium, is gradually incorporating new humanist ideas trickling in from the continent. The daily life of a Cambridge student is rigorous. They are expected to attend multiple classes throughout the day, covering subjects ranging from logic to rhetoric to theology and philosophy. 
The duration of their studies varies, but most pursue a Bachelor of Arts degree, a journey that takes about three to four years. Beyond academics, the presence of the university deeply influences the local economy. Inns, bookshops, and trades catering to the needs of students and faculty flourish. The town and gown relationship is a symbiotic one, albeit occasionally strained with the typical frictions that arise when a powerful institution is embedded within a small town. As these students make their way to their respective colleges, they're not just pursuing personal advancement. They are also upholding a tradition of learning that has become a cornerstone of English intellectual and cultural life. The University of Cambridge during the Reformation stands as a microcosm of societal change, a place where the future leaders of Tudor England are molded. By 9 a.m., the academic heart of Cambridge beats with the rhythm of lectures and debates. The university is a hotbed for theological and philosophical discussions, and it plays a pivotal role in shaping the intellectual landscape of the Reformation era. Lectures at Cambridge are no longer confined to medieval scholasticism. Instead, they explore a broad array of subjects reflecting the burgeoning spirit of humanism. The classics, Greek and Latin literature, history and moral philosophy are taught alongside more traditional subjects like logic and theology. This diverse curriculum sets the stage for vigorous debates, especially in theology, which is in a state of flux because of the Reformation. Cambridge becomes a forum where Reformation ideas are not just studied but actively debated. Professors and students alike engage in discussions about Martin Luther's teachings, the authority of the Pope versus the monarchy, and the interpretation of the Bible. These debates are more than academic exercises. They are crucibles where the personal faith and doctrine are tested and formed. The university's role in fostering Reformation ideas is significant. It serves as a nexus for new religious and political thought, influencing not just its students, but also the broader societal and religious landscape of England. As young minds grapple with these transformative ideas, Cambridge solidifies its reputation as an institution at the forefront of religious and intellectual change in Tudor England. By 10 a.m., Cambridge's marketplace buzzes with activity, epitomizing the vibrant economic life of a university town. Among the throng is a merchant, a key figure in this bustling microcosm. His day is in full swing, his stall a hub of commerce for both townsfolk and university members. This merchant, like many in Tudor Cambridge, benefits from the constant demand generated by the university. He deals in a variety of goods, textiles, spices, perhaps even some luxury items like imported wines catering to the wealthier scholars and local gentry. His interactions are not just commercial, they're social engagements, allowing him to glean news and participate in the town's grapevine. Trade in Cambridge is a delicate balance of catering to the everyday needs of residents and the specific demands of the university community. This merchant, adept in his trade, represents the economic vitality that the university injects into the town. His livelihood is intertwined with the rhythms of academic life, and his success is a testament to the symbiotic relationship between town and gown. By 11 a.m., the rigors of the morning lectures give way to a brief respite for the students of Cambridge. One such student, having spent the morning immersed in challenging academic discussions, now takes his time to engage in the social and recreational aspects of university life. This student, like his peers, finds relaxation in activities that are both physically and socially engaging. They might gather for a game of stool ball, which was an early form of cricket, on the commons, or engage in spirited debates under the shade of ancient trees. These moments are not just for leisure, they are crucial for forging friendships and networks that will last a lifetime, same as today. The social norms of the university are a mix of scholarly decorum and youthful exuberance. Students from different colleges often mingle, sharing news and gossip, while also discussing the latest scholarly ideas. This hour of mid-morning activities provides a necessary balance to academic pursuits offering a glimpse into the personal growth and social education that occurs alongside formal studies in Tudor Cambridge. At noon, the streets slow down as the town's inhabitants, including a prominent alderman, prepare for the day's main meal. In the Tudor period, the midday meal, or dinner, holds a significant importance. It was the most substantial meal of the day. In the alderman's house, a grand luncheon is a daily occurrence, showcasing both his social status and the customs of the period. The table brims with an array of dishes, pottage, hearty stew of meat and vegetables, 
freshly baked bread and, for a man of his means, luxurious items like roasted meats and fish. The beverages include ale, a staple in Tudor diets, wine, a mark of his affluence. Sweet meats and fruits might follow as desserts, rounding off the meal. This time is not just for dining, but also networking. The alderman is a key link between the town and the university, and he often hosts other civic leaders, prosperous merchants, and sometimes university officials. These gatherings are pivotal for discussing civic affairs, the town-gown relationship, and the broader socio-political climate of Tudor England. The Tudor eating schedule typically comprises a light breakfast, then this substantial midday meal, and a lighter supper in the evening. For the aldermen and his peers, these dining customs are integral to their daily rhythm, reflecting the period's social stratification and the interplay of personal, civic, and academic life in Cambridge. As the clock strikes 1 p.m., the legacy of an influential figure, Robert Record, looms large in the world of academia, particularly in the fields of mathematics and science. Record was a pioneer in the 16th century and alumnus of Cambridge, is renowned for introducing the equals sign, those little two lines, which is a fundamental symbol in mathematics, and he's the one who first introduced that. In this afternoon lecture, maybe the professor who is teaching studied with Robert Record uses his works as a cornerstone for teaching. Record was not just a mathematician, he was also a visionary who sought to make complex ideas accessible. He authored several textbooks in the form of dialogues, a revolutionary approach at the time, making mathematical concepts more understandable for a broader audience. The professor highlights Record's last book, which tragically ends with the author being arrested for debt, illustrating the often precarious balance between intellectual pursuit and the harsh realities of Tudor England. The story resonates with students underscoring the human aspect behind the development of scientific thought. Record's work serves as a reminder of the shifting sands of this period. The Reformation had ushered in an age where questioning and individual inquiry were valued, traits that Record embodied in his work. His innovative approach to education, particularly in mathematics, laid the foundations for the scientific achievements that would follow in the coming centuries, including, of course, the groundbreaking work of later scholars in Cambridge like Isaac Newton. As the professor leads the class through the mathematical problems and discussions, the spirit of Robert Record is still there. Contributions that are not just historical footnotes, living parts of the university's rich academic tapestry, inspiring a new generation of thinkers who stand on the shoulder of giants. By 2 p.m., the religious landscape of Cambridge is a tableau of debate and transformation. The university is known for its receptiveness to Protestant ideas and becomes a focal point for religious discourse, significantly impacting the town's daily life and the role of the local churches. In the mid-1520s, a group of Cambridge students referred to as Little Germany began meeting at the White Horse Tavern. This group included notable figures like Robert Barnes, Hugh Latimer, John Frith, Thomas Bilney, Thomas Arthur, and they played a crucial role in fostering Protestant thought. Their discussions were steeped in reformist ideas, reflecting a growing discontent with the established church and a yearning for religious and doctrinal change. These intellectual gatherings at the White Horse Tavern symbolized the shifting religious attitudes within Cambridge. Local churches, once the unchallenged centers of spiritual life, now find themselves in the heart of controversy. Clergy members are compelled to navigate between traditional Catholic doctrines and emerging Protestant views, often leading to heated debates within their congregations. The impact of these religious discussions extend beyond the confines of the university and taverns. They permeate the daily life of Cambridge, influencing everything from family workshop practices to public discourse. The very fabric of society is being re-examined through the lens of these religious debates, leading to significant changes in how faith is practiced and understood. As the afternoon progresses, the town and gown alike are engulfed in a religious and cultural metamorphosis. Cambridge, through places like the White Horse Tavern, emerges as the crucible for reformist ideas shaping not just the local religious life, but also contributing to the broader history of the English Reformation. By 3 p.m., the artistic scene, particularly music, comes into focus, showcasing the vibrant cultural life of the period. The university and town are not just centers of academic and religious debate, but also thriving hubs of artistic expression. Notable figure in this artistic landscape is Robert Fairfax, 
a celebrated musician and composer. Fairfax is an organist at St. Albans Abbey and was the first doctor of music at Cambridge, serving as a bridge between the university and the royal court. His contributions highlight the significant role that Cambridge plays in the musical life of the nation. Fairfax's legacy is particularly renowned for his service both to Henry VII and Henry VIII, composing music for events like the Field of Cloth of Gold in 1520. Fairfax's work and stature are indicative of the flourishing art scene during the Tudor period. Musicians, writers, and performers find patronage both within the university and the broader aristocratic circles. This environment fosters a rich tapestry of artistic output, ranging from courtly music to religious music, reflecting the diverse influences of the time. At 4 p.m. in Tudor Cambridge, the focus shifts to the practicalities of daily life as seen through the eyes of an apprentice. This young individual learning a trade under the tutelage of a master craftsman is integral to the town's economic and social fabric. The apprentice's afternoon is filled with a variety of tasks ranging from assisting in the workshop to running errands. These chores are not merely laborious, they are essential steps in his education, teaching him not just the skills of the trade, but also the nuances of managing a business. This period of apprenticeship, which could last several years, is a time of growth and learning, preparing him to one day become a master himself. In the bustling streets, he interacts with other townsfolk, from merchants to fellow apprentices, each busy with their own responsibilities. This interaction is a vital part of his social education, helping him understand the dynamics of town life and the importance of community and cooperation in a thriving economy. As the day begins to wind down at 5 p.m., a seminary student in Cambridge engages in the evening prayers and reflection, activities that highlight the profound religious shifts of the Reformation period. Pre-Reformation, the students' religious practices were steeped in the Catholic tradition with Latin prayers and a focus on ritual and sacrament. Post-Reformation, these practices have undergone a significant transformation. The prayers are now in English, making them more personal and accessible. The emphasis has shifted from ritual to personal faith and understanding of the scriptures. This seminary student, like many others, is navigating a world where religious beliefs and practices are being questioned and redefined. His studies include not just theological teaching, but also new ideas emerging from the Reformation. This period is a time of introspection and learning as he grapples with the changing nature of faith and his role in the religious life of the community. Evening prayers and reflection thus become a time for this student to contemplate not just his personal beliefs, but also the larger religious landscape in England and Europe. It's a time to reconcile the teachings of the past with the evolving doctrines of the present. As 6 p.m. arrives, the households of Cambridge gather for supper, a lighter meal compared to the midday dinner, no less significant for family bonding and community. In a typical Tudor home, the family comes together around a modest table, sharing a meal that includes pottage, bread, and leftovers from the midday meal. Supper is a time for conversation where family members exchange their stories of the day, discuss local news, and reinforce social and religious norms. As dusk falls, the townspeople of Cambridge engage in various forms of leisure and entertainment, Popular activities include music, storytelling, and folk dances. By 7 p.m., the local taverns are buzz with activity, providing a space for socializing and playing games like cards or dice and enjoying performances by traveling minstrels. These evening activities are not just pastimes. They play a crucial role in maintaining the social fabric of the town, offering a respite from the day's labors and an opportunity for community bonding. By 8 p.m., the curfew bell is ringing, signaling an end to the day's activities and the time to secure your home for the night. This bell is a common feature in Tudor towns, serving as a reminder for people to douse their fires and candles a precaution against the all-too-common threat of fire. In households, families complete their final chores, such as securing animals, locking doors. Nighttime routines include family prayers, particularly poignant in an age when religious practices are under scrutiny and transformation. The curfew not only marks the physical end of the day, but also reinforces the communal responsibility towards safety and order, crucial in a tightly knit community like Cambridge.
At 9 p.m., the quieter corners of Cambridge are alight with the flicker of candles as students and scholars engage in personal studies. This time is essential for delving deeper into the day's lectures, reading, and preparing for debates. Libraries and study halls become sanctuaries of concentration where the pursuit of knowledge continues beyond the confines of structured classes. In these hours, students grapple with complex texts, draft essays, refine their understanding of the challenging concepts shaping their intellectual world. Things are still going strong in the taverns. By 10 p.m., the taverns and inns pulse with the vibrant social life of the town. These establishments are more than mere drinking places. They are the social hubs where townsfolk, students, and scholars come together. The taverns of Cambridge play a crucial role in community bonding and the dissemination of ideas. Heated discussions on religious politics and philosophy are as common as the clinking of ale mugs. In these lively settings, the latest news, gossip, and scholarly ideas circulate freely among the patrons. The atmosphere is a mix of jovial camaraderie and intellectual debate, reflecting the diverse nature of Tudor society. These taverns are places where relationships are forged, alliances are formed, and sometimes where tensions between the town and gown surface. The role of taverns in Tudor Cambridge extends beyond mere entertainment. They are integral to the cultural and intellectual fabric of the town, serving as informal extensions of the university's scholarly environment. By 11 p.m., a calmer side is emerging. The streets are growing quiet as most residents are back in their homes. However, for some, the night is still young. A few scholars and artists might be found immersed in their work, inspired by the tranquility of the night. Others might engage in quiet conversations under the stars, pondering the mysteries of the universe or the latest philosophical theories. These late-night activities, though less visible, are still a testament to the unceasing quest for knowledge and understanding that characterizes the spirit of Tudor Cambridge. As the clock in the bell tower strikes midnight, our day in Tudor Cambridge draws to a close. The city rests under the cloak of darkness, but the echoes of its vibrant life linger in the air. This journey through a typical day has revealed a community at the nexus of significant historical and cultural transformations. The Reformation's impact is palpable in every aspect of Cambridge's life, from scholarly debates within the university's ancient halls to the evening prayers in the family homes. It has reshaped religious practices, academic pursuits, and even the mundane rhythms of daily existence. Cambridge, with its blend of intellectual rigor, religious fervor, and rich cultural tapestry, stands as a microcosm of the Reformation's transformative power. This day has not just been a journey through time, it has been a window into the dynamic process of change, reflecting the enduring legacy of the Reformation on the city and its people, a legacy that continues to shape the course of history. So there we have it, my friends, a day in Tudor Cambridge. I hope you enjoyed that. Let me know in the comments. Remember, you can join the YouTube channel to get extra videos and extra content. This week's members only video is going to be another breakdown of a Tudor painting and the imagery and metaphor within it. So click the join button to get all kinds of cool perks as well as that video and many others that are coming. There's at least one a week. And remember to check out tutorfair.com for the Tudor Planner. I'll put a link in the description as well. Hey, thank you so much for listening. Look, I get that there are so many places where you can spend your time. You can, like, I go onto YouTube or I go on the podcast, my podcast app or Spotify, and it's like, I want to listen to it all. Life is too short for the amount of content that there is that I want to consume. Like, I saw a meme at ha- Halloween and it was like, I want to dress as a vampire who lives forever just so I can read all of the books that I want to read. And like, I am so sane. I so feel that. There's so much content. I want to listen to it all. I want to read it all. So that is to say, I appreciate you spending this time with me. And I get that you have many, many choices. And you chose to listen to this whole, if you are here right now, it means you spend the entire day in Tudor Cambridge with me and we are bonded. So I hope that I earned your subscription to my channel or my podcast, wherever you're listening to this. Go ahead and leave me a comment. Let me know what other episodes you would like me to do, what else you would like me to cover in this show. Thank you for listening. I so appreciate it. 
and I will be back again very soon. I hope you're having a wonderful week. Go have an amazing day. Don't forget to drink your water. Super important to stay hydrated. I'm a mom. I have to say that kind of stuff. I will talk to you soon, my friends. Bye-bye. Blow, northern wind, ascend, who may be sweaty.